أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى آل بيتي الطيبين الطاهرين الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية سيدي ومولاي علي بن أبي طالب الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنحتدي لولا أن هدانا الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي In the name of God, the most beneficent, the most merciful, we ask Allah to send his greatest peace and blessings upon Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. We praise Allah for all the blessings he has given us and the greatest blessing being that he allowed us to be of the ones who remain steadfast, dedicated and loyal on the path of our master after the Prophet, the commander of the faithful, the prince of the believers, the protector of the Prophet and his message, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. We praise Allah for this blessing and every blessing for without Allah, we would have nothing. Assalamu alaikum, my dear respected brothers and sisters. Wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today we're continuing our conversations, our discussions on the vision of a virtuous community. And we've covered much so far from divine guidance and understanding how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his justice has given us the messengers, the prophets, and the imams, how he has spoken to us through his word and through the individuals that are implementing his message. And inshallah, we're going to be continuing in these conversations, in these discussions, to understand this relationship that we have with the Imam of our time, with the last viceroy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on earth, being Al Imam Al Hujjat Al Mahdi Al Muntadar, Muhammad ibn Hassan Al Askari. This individual, alayhi salam, what is our relationship with him? In order for us to understand and have a better relationship with him, it would be pertinent for us to get a better understanding of how did things develop at his time? As in, what was the situation that he was born in? What was the transition between him and his father, Imam Hassan al-Askari? What was the conditions that they were living in during the Abbasid uh, regime? Furthermore, when we hear of the idea of occultation, when the Imam entered this uh, period of an occultation, there was a period of time before what we know today as the major occultation or the era of occultation that we're living in, and that was the minor occultation. How long did the minor occultation uh, go for? Were there representatives or deputies of the Imam during this period of time, and how many were there? And then further, when it comes to the last deputy that had existed, what happened after that deputy and who did people go to after the last representative or the last ambassador of the Imam uh, passed away? As we know that our Imam السلام, was born about a thousand years ago. When we're looking at his existence and his presence with us, though it's not something that is completely pecu peculiar as we have seen in history, individuals like our Prophet Nuh السلام, who lived over 950 years and other individuals such as Isa السلام, our Prophet Jesus who he himself would be an individual where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not allow him to be taken or by, be killed by people and would elevate him to the heavens and protect uh, the Prophet السلام. but the better understanding that we get when we learn of the details of the experiences of the imams and try to make sure that we're getting ourselves closer to him through learning his story, I recommend uh, in this journey for us as we're trying to learn the stories of the imams, learn the stories of the prophets themselves, I recommended, I believe it was in the first lecture, a book called God's Emissaries by Sheikh Razwan Arustu. Uh, that's an excellent book as a reference to understand and learn more in depth of the lives of the prophets. And another book that I would recommend is uh, The Progeny by Sayyid Ali al-Hakim. It's a book that goes into a highlight-based um, highlight approach to the lives of the uh, Imams of Ahlul Bayt salam. And though they're not uh, pure biographies, what they do is they're looking at certain principles and values that uh, made up who they were as individuals or were highlighted in their lives. It's a very beneficial read. 
And I encourage you throughout these lectures and throughout these talks, try to supplement them with additional research, supplement them with additional readings. And as we continue along, I may have more recommendations as we go, inshallah. Let's jump right into it. Um, when it came to the situation that Imam al-Mahdi was uh, living in, the situation and the circumstances of the time were extremely dire. Historically, when we look at the challenges that the Imams faced, they faced a number of dynasties. You had the Umayyad dynasty that would come through Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan and with Yazid and then their descendants. That would last for about 90 years. The Abbasid dynasty that would come at the lifetime of Imam Jafar al-Sadiq alayhi salam, our sixth Imam, would be one that would last for hundreds of years after that. And for the most part, that was the dynasty that the Imams lived through. The Abbasid dynasty initially would come out as one that was taking vengeance against the Umayyads in the honor and the name of Ahlul Bayt salam. They themselves claiming to be from the Ahlul Bayt or relatives of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu through the relationship through their forefather, Al-Abbas, the Prophet's uncle. Now, when we're looking at the dynasty, you would be looking at a number of rulers that existed. For example, during the life of Imam Rada alayhi salam, the challenges that he faced with the Abbasid uh, ruler of his time was different than Imam al-Askari. And throughout these periods of time, when you had these rulers being busied with troubles or challenges or conquests, whether they were external affairs that they were dealing with in their empire, or they were dealing with internal issues and, and um, strife that they faced, from uh, civic society, that would affect and impact the relationship that the Imams had with their followers. And in a way that the more tension that came from the ruling authorities, the less ability uh, that the followers of Ahlul Bayt had to go and move and uh, flow with the Imams, where at certain times that the Imams even practiced a taqiyah with their followers, where their followers would come, uh, would come to them and in order to protect them from the authorities who had sent spies and people throughout the, uh, throughout the empire to observe the followers of Ahlul Bayt salam, and to keep an eye on them so that no kind, of, uh, no kind of political movement was being made at the time. They would guard their followers by at certain times making sure that they gave them um, instructions that may not necessarily reflect the, uh, the belief of the Imams. And by that, what we're essentially talking about is the Imams throughout the time, their top priority was guarding the faith and guarding the believers. So depending on how uh, stringent the ruling authorities were and the danger that was placed on their lives and the lives of the, their followers, they were very cognizant of the situation with the ruling authorities. So at times instructions would be made to protect their followers so that those spies of the authorities would, uh, would not pay them too much more attention saying that, you know what, this person isn't necessarily a follower uh, of the Ahlul Bayt. In fact, he's someone, he's just of the masses. He's someone, um, just one of the, uh, the majority of people. We don't have to pay him much attention. Because there were people that were following Ahlul Bayt um, at that time secretly um, because people were being persecuted. Um, during the Umayyad dynasty, followers of Ahlul Bayt were being persecuted openly. Most of the time during the Abbasid dynasty, the, uh, the followers of Ahlul Bayt salam, were being perse persecuted uh, in secret. Now, when we come to the time of Imam al Askari, salam, and as with his forefathers, throughout the lives of the Imams, their lives were threatened because they were looked at as a threat by the rulers. Whether it was during the time of Imam Rada alayhi salam, where the Abbasid Caliph of his time actually wanted to prop up his own establishment and his own uh, administration by having the Imam named as his heir apparent uh, and having him as his designated successor. 
even though the imam didn't want that position, to secure the, uh, the well-being and the safety of his followers and the Muslims in general, uh, he would presume that, that role. But lo and behold, not too long after that, um, the imam would be ordered to be uh, poisoned and killed. And that was the condition that most of the imams actually faced was they all died by, by poison. And that poison was uh, administered by the ruling authorities of the time. For what reason? They didn't want people to grow in number and following these individuals who Muslims just naturally gravitated towards uh, them, uh, not even necessarily by them preaching uh, their word or them calling to people to, to follow them. Um, Imam al-Sadiq himself being one to say, be a call unto us without your tongues. And that's something that the Imams practiced and they preached where when they engaged with people, it was simply their conduct. It was simply their ability to relate to people, to treat people with fairness and kindness, be an extension of that mercy of our Holy Prophet Muhammad as that mercy to mankind. So people gravitated towards them and people wanted to be close to them. At every one of these ruling authorities, though again, they faced their own troubles, they faced their own issues and um, were challenged throughout their administrations, there was a, a returning theme that they kept on having to address, which was how do we look at the, uh, the followers of Ahlul Bayt, the followers of the Prophet, um, the followers of the family of the Prophet and their Imams. Their Imams for the Abbasids, being technically their relatives and their cousins. And this ongoing discussion that they would have in many of the standoffs between the Imams and them, the standoffs that were uh, initiated by the Abbasid rulers themselves, whether it was in times to uh, prop themselves up or to um, address certain things that were concerns within their own court, they would face off with the Imams and um, one thing would lead to another, uh, especially when it came to the later imams where they acted more quickly and had them uh, disposed of and uh, killed by administration of, uh, of poison. And Imam al-Askari alayhi salam, during his lifetime, the, there was talks of him being the uh, 11th imam and counting the imams and looking at the narrations of the Holy Prophet alayhi, where he would say that there were 12 princes after me, these are my caliphs, awalahum ali wa akharahum Muhammad ibn my son or my great grandson Muhammad. People were waiting to see the last Imam of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam. So the Abbasid rulers during the lifetime of Imam al Askari, they were taking a close watch of his house, of his home, of his family, the people that were coming and going out of his house. And in fact, for the last uh, years of his life, he was placed under house arrest. That house arrest um, was one where the, uh, the, the authorities would constantly be patrolling around the house. Uh, they moved him to Samarra, where he was living there. Um, the house was a small one. Not many people could uh, go and come. And miraculously, our Imam al-Mahdi, um, Imam al-Askari's son would be born in that home, but the pregnancy of his, his mother would be concealed. And no one would know of the birth of uh, the Imam except a few uh, people that were considered to be the confidants of the Imam, uh, a few family members uh, that were very close to the family and kept that secret. In fact, that secret would continue to be kept until uh, Imam al-Askari alayhi salam uh, was killed. And when he was killed and when he was poisoned, Imam uh, al-Mahdi ajallallahu ta'ala faraj al-Sharif was six years old. Now, <clears throat> at that time, Now, at that time, <clears throat> the Imam, like we said, 
when he was uh, when he was born, it was a secret that was kept uh, by uh, the family and by the individuals that were closest to the imam. Some family members actually didn't even know that the imam was born. Um, for example, when Imam al-Askari was, uh, was killed and he was poisoned and uh, his funeral took place, at his funeral, um, his brother would come forward and he would be known as, later become to be known as Jafar al-Kadhab, uh, Jafar the liar. And why? It was because he came at the funeral of the Imam and he proclaimed that he was the next Imam. Imam, al uh, imam al-Mahdi, uh, peace and blessing to be upon him, this young six-year-old boy would come to the forefront of the funeral and with his hand gesture to his uncle to move to the side uh, and pray over his, his father. And this was a symbolic um, a gesture that was done and is still done to this day, uh, even with some of our grand scholars, where the person who is praying over the imam is not prayed over except by another imam. So Jafar al-Kadhab, Imam Mahdi's uncle, who came forward and wanted to pray over the imam and assume this role of now I'm the leader of the people, now I'm the leader of the followers of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam, um, that would not happen because Imam al-Mahdi, even though he was a young boy, he would assume this role. Uh, and even though many people didn't even know that he actually existed. So Imam al-Mahdi would enter into the minor occultation immediately after this, uh, this time. He would show himself to the people, make it evident, make it apparent. And though this was at the bewilderment of the Abbasid uh, authorities, where they didn't even know that he existed, and they thought what they were able to do was to contain the Imam and not allow for his progeny to continue keeping him under house arrest, monitoring the house, uh, not allowing anybody to be able to uh, come in and out, and then eventually having him poisoned and killed, they thought it just ended there. But again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will was manifested, and the Prophet in his, uh, in his saying that the princes after him, the khulafa after him, the people that are going to carry on this guardianship of the faith and the faithful, they're 12 and the last of them is Muhammad al-Mahdi. He would be born, he would be six years old as his assumption of the active uh, leadership or active imamah would take place. And he would enter uh, the minor occultation for what reason? When we're looking at the occultation, the primary concept here of the occultation being that it is protecting the guardian or the viceroy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's placed on earth. We're going to be talking about this in more detail, inshallah, as the nights continue, as some of the nights that are dedicated in our presentations are dedicated uh, specifically to understanding the system of occultation, the different forms of occultation, and the different individuals that actually experienced occultation historically. Uh, just as a, uh, a sneak peek of that, Prophet uh, Yusuf alayhi salam, uh, experienced an occultation. Prophet Moses alayhi salam experienced an occultation. Prophet Isa alayhi salam, Jesus experienced an occultation. The tradition of occultation was one that was a mechanism by divine, uh, by divine guidance established for humanity, established for these viceroys of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on earth to protect them when the circumstances of their time were ones where people were using their free will to fight against the uh, representatives of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So take the example of Imam al-Mahdi and at, at his time where he was the last designated disciple of our Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa The disciples of the Prophet being 12, he is the 12th. He had to be protected. He had to be preserved. Similar to the situation with Imam Ali Zain al Abidin alayhi salam, where our Imam Hussein on the day of Ashura, one of the, the heart wrenching experiences that's, that's had is seeing the scene where Imam Zain al Abidin would come out from his tent and want to fight along his side, his father, who had been left with no one, no companion, no son, no brother. Al Abbas is gone, Ali al Akbar is gone, Al Qasim is gone, all of the companions are gone, fallen, slain on the lands of Karbala. 
And Imam Zain Abidin, this sick, ill, frail young man, is dragging his sword on the sand, walking with a cane, trying to come forward and protect his father. Imam Hussein salam would see this call onto his sister, Lady Zainab, and, and tell her, Oh, Zainab, protect Zain al Abidin, take him back into the tent. If he is to enter the battlefield and be killed, then there will be no proof of Allah left on the face of this earth. And the hujja of Allah must remain. The proof of God out of his justice and out of the system that God has established for us is one that it will continue to remain until the end of time, until the day of judgment. And our holy imam, our 12th imam, is that last viceroy, is that last disciple of the prophet that assumes this role of manifesting God's justice as his proof upon the creation. So this imam at the age of six years old, his father was killed and the active imamat uh, became in his domain. So the imam salam, in this position would enter into the minor occultation for the reason of protecting and preserving himself because of the authorities and the circumstances of the time wanted him killed at whatever cost. This was something that was observed and actually prepared for by the previous Imams. So Imam Al-Askari, Imam Al-Hadi, and Imam Al-Jawad, their role when you're looking at the movement of the Imams, the movement of the Imams experienced eras of uh, preparing the believers in different ways. For example, with Imam, uh, Imam Ali, Amir Al-Mu'mineen salam, Imam Al-Hassan, Imam al Hussein. What they did was they had they formed a role of providing the foundations and protecting the foundations of the belief in our Holy Prophet Muhammad in Islam, protecting the body of Islam, and giving the followers of Ahlul Bayt a very uh, a very solid foundation in what it meant to be part of that wilaya, to be part of that allegiance, to associate with Ahlul Bayt salam and know Ali ibn Abi Talib, Amir al muminin not just as the individual, but as the thought, as al-haq, and being that truth that is differentiated from everything else. And that emphasis of that connection through him, as in that service to the Holy Prophet and ultimately submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That was his will. Al-Imam Ali, Al-Imam Al-Hassan, Imam al Hussein, they created that foundation for, Ahl, for the followers of Ahl al-Bayt. From Al-Imam Zain al-Abideen, unto Imam al-Baqir, unto Imam Jafar al-Sadiq, and Imam al-Kadhim, um, and somewhat to an extent to Imam al-Radha, who he himself would be in a transition to, a transitionary uh, or transitory uh, phase, unto the, the later Imams, they would create a foundation for the jurisprudential identity of the followers of Ahlul Bayt in clarifying what were the, the rules, the laws, and the, fa the, the practices that uh, m that were established for the followers of Ahl al Bayt, and then after that came this preparation from a uh, a social aspect and how to live and survive during a time where, from even the time of Imam al Kadhim uh, forward, that how to survive a time where the authorities limited that engagement with the Imams. Uh, to a certain extent where the imams were imprisoned or they were moved away from the people, uh, they were moved from place to place, uh, from Medina to Kufa, from Kufa to, uh, uh, to Persia, from Persia back to Samarra and other places throughout the, uh, the empire. If we look at the movement of the imams, it's essential to, again, see them like we established a few nights ago, looking at them horizontally that they were part of the same project, the same mission, the same vision, and the same strategy. And depending on the circumstances of, of, of the time, they had to adapt and focus on certain aspects with their followers. Like we mentioned yesterday with Imam Zain al-Abidin salam the aspect of spirituality and spiritual rejuvenation taught through his psalms, his supplications, was a huge part of his legacy as an individual, as an imam, uh, because of the spiritual death that was experienced by uh, the people of the ummah after the tragedy, after the massacre of, uh, of Karbala. Now, with our Imam, he entered this minor occultation. 
And through this minor occultation, which we asked in the very beginning, how long did it last? And um, what was the relationship uh, had between the Imam and his followers when they couldn't reach him? This occultation being not that the Imam was taken and placed in a, a place where um, he was not on, on earth, for example, like the occultation of Prophet Isa, السلام, but with his occultation, his identity was concealed from people. So people could reach him, but it was only those that were the closest to him that could actually reach him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala concealed him from people in order that he may be protected. So for 60 years, the Imam alayhi salam communicated to his followers through designated deputies or ambassadors. And these ambassadors, uh, representatives of the Imam who had this direct relationship with the Imam were four individuals um, who were uh, companions of his father, Imam al-Askari. Some of these companions, like the first, Uthman ibn Sa'id al-Asadi, was already a, considered to be a deputy or representative of the Imam. Note here, when we're looking at these relationships, the deputies of the Imam, again, the Imams before them had already began emphasizing the relationships that they had with their companions that they trusted in their abilities, both in knowledge and trustworthiness and piety, etc., as being representatives of the faith, as being representatives of the Imams themselves to their followers. And Imam Jafar al-Sadiq would praise and, and even at, at their death would cry over individuals like Zurara for being such an, uh, a beautiful personality and uh, describing people like Zurara and Muhammad ibn Muslim as being the nearest and dearest people to him, uh, both of those that were alive and that were dead. All the way from uh, these Imams, there was this emphasis on these individuals that were scholars in their own right, companions of the Imam, trusted individuals who, even during the lifetime of Imam al-Baqir, Imam Sadiq, when people would come to them, they would ask them certain jurisprudential questions, for example, and the Imams would turn to, uh, turn to their companions and tell them and tell these individuals that are asking, why didn't you go and ask my companion so and so when you had this question? As in indicating to them that listen, I'm entrusting in them. In, in this capacity that they have as being my representative, as being one who can give you the religious laws because they represent me. So our Imam al-Mahdi, this idea of deputyship was not a, a new one. It was something that was prepared for in the, in the vision of the Imams, knowing that this time of occultation would come, knowing that the last disciple of our Holy Prophet Muhammad being our Imam al-Mahdi would enter in this period of time where to protect him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would conceal his identity and only a few would be able to reach him. So these four deputies would come into play and be the ones who would represent the Imam uh, with his followers. So when it came to the religious questions, the religious duties, um, paying their khums, um, seeking any kind of guidance when it came to their, their, their lives, they would go through these uh, companions of Imam al-Askari who would be the deputies of the Imam. And again, he would be at the age of six when the, the minor occultation would begin. And this minor occultation would last for over 60 years. The first uh, deputy of the Imam being Uthman ibn Sa'id al-Asadi, he would be a deputy in his role until he would pass um, for about seven years. Then his son, Abu Jafar Muhammad ibn Uthman, would be the deputy for about 37 years. And he played a very consequential role for the length of time that he had in being the deputy of the Imam. After he would pass in, in 917 AD, um, Abu Qasim Hussein ibn Ruh would be the next deputy uh, for the Imam. And he would be the deputy for about 20 years. Then finally, uh, Abu al-Hasan Ali ibn Muhammad, he would be the last deputy and it would only last for about three years. In his role, he, though it was a short period of time, he would play the same role as the, the, the previous deputies. After his, or the coming of his death, right before it, the Imam would let his followers know 
through the deputy himself that the door of deputyship, direct representation of the imam would close when the fourth deputy would pass away. Now, when the fourth deputy passed away, it wasn't that the followers of Ahlul Bayt السلام, had, had no way of implementing their faith and staying connected to the imams. However, the direct representation of the imam where he is designating himself publicly to the people and telling people, this is my deputy, that ended. That door was closed. But after that, the imam made it clear to his followers, how do you stay connected with me? How do you stay safeguarding your faith and understanding and knowing your responsibility before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and making sure that you're staying on our path? Again, this connection to Ahlul Bayt alayhum as -salam, does not cease when the imam is in occultation. And to the contrary, it should be strengthened in the sense that we're longing for him more and we're not taking for granted his presence. Though we can't see him, though he's concealed from us, he is still like the sun behind the clouds. We're still benefiting from his warmth, from, from his rays. We're still getting that. Now, the imam advised when it came to who would the people go after who would they who who do they go to after the last deputy passed away? The Imam himself would advise. He would say, And as for the current affairs, go back to the narrators of our traditions. They are my proof on you, and I am the proof. Of God. Now, this is a famously famously narrated hadith, one that is uh, notably used um, in, in understanding the whole idea of representation of the Imam, uh, even in an indirect way when it comes to the system of taqlid, the system of following or emulating scholars, where the Imam himself is giving us this guidance, saying, when it comes to the new matters that you're facing, the new issues. Of course, certain things are clear cut when it comes to some of our obligations, but definitely there's certain things that come up on a, on a, uh, a normal basis in our lives, new challenges that we face. And the individuals that, that fill this role, according to the Imam, he's giving us clear direction is listen, the narratives of, of our traditions, the narratives of our traditions are essentially the scholars. And the scholar is not just merely anybody who is studying or one who is on a scholarly path, but those are the individuals that are considered to be experts in the narration, experts in the jurisprudence, in the Islamic law, in uh, understanding our furu ad din and uh, what our obligations and practices uh, and worship are, and worship and transaction. So this, by the way, is essential for us to understand when it comes to the system of marja'iyya, the system of taqlid, the system of the hawza, the Islamic seminary, uh, these institutions that were built, again, the, the foregrounds of them and the infrastructure of them were established from the times of the imam. So for example, and inshallah, we're gonna be discussing this in more detail in the coming nights, when it came to the institution of the hawza itself, the Islamic seminary is not one that is a new institution. In, in actuality, it was one that was established way back at the time of Imam al-Baqir and Imam Jafar al-Sadiq Imam Jafar al-Sadiq having had 4,000 plus students in Kufa alone in the seminary that he established. When we look at the tradition of the Imams and seeing they from the very beginning established for us what we need to do and where we need to go to in order for us to preserve our faith. For what reason? Why were they working on this so early on? Again, for them manifesting the role as the Imams, the ones implementing and implementing the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, educating people, safeguarding their faith, leading them, setting the example, giving them the practical implementation of how to uh, reach their potential as followers of the Holy Prophet and ultimately servants of Allah Azza wa Jal. The Imam didn't leave us alone. The Imam didn't leave us um, astray. 
the Imam made sure that he would have the system established from his forefathers and would continue on. And that is why it's so important for us to connect to the Imam and make sure that we understand the struggles that they faced and what they sacrificed in order for us to preserve our faith. And then acknowledge the sacrifices of all of the individuals throughout history, from our early scholars to our contemporary scholars, the lifestyle that they have committed to in safeguarding the heritage of Ahlul Bayt and making it a living practice for us to make sure that we understand what our obligations to God are. Now, of course, some things like we said are clear, but some of them are not. It is those scholars that have committed themselves to becoming the ruwati hadithina, the narrators of our traditions, the ones that are experts in their field and have committed themselves to a lifelong journey of learning so that they can translate to us what our obligations are when we don't have that direct access to the imam. Putting this all together, brothers and sisters, we've addressed one, when it comes to the relationship that we have with the Imam, understanding historically the situation that his father and his grandfathers faced in, in the challenges that they faced with the Abbasid dynasty, with the ruling authorities, and the sacrifices that they made were, they even had to conceal the birth of the Imam and his existence was not even known except by a few uh, until the death of his father, Imam al-Asqar We described that situation and the home of the Imam in which he was born in that saddab, in that basement, where he was able to uh, be protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will, and then he would even enter his minor occultation uh, through that uh, same house at the age of six. We've addressed that his uh, his deputies were four individuals. And these four individuals continued on in that role of deputyship for about 60 years. We addressed that when it came to the final deputy and what would happen after him, that the Imam would give clear instruction to his followers on who to follow and who to go back to. Inshallah, in the coming nights, we're gonna go into a little bit more uh, of, of detail and background into the institutions that would make up this in the modern day the scholars that would follow, and they came to the institutions of the Hawza, the Islamic seminary, the Marji'iyah and Taqlid, the importance of the autonomy and independence of these institutions from the governments of their time and from other affiliations and organizations, and the sacrifices that were made in order to protect the integrity of this wilaya, the allegiance to Ahlul Bayt salam, and ultimately the body of Islam and protecting that religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We end with this. وَهَذَا وَالْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ وَأَفْضِلُ الصَّلَاةُ وَالتَّسْلِيمُ عَلَىٰ نَبِيِّنَا مُحَمَّدُ وَعَلَىٰ آلِ بَيْتِهِ الطَّيِّبِينَ الطَّاهِرِينَ